got something happening now. It's just very slowly got a circle. Still yep, haven't... Live. I'm live. It's not showing green, but I'm live. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, sorry about the slight delay. We just had a little bit of technical problems there. Um, Hopefully this will um, <clears throat> okay. Hey, good morning, everyone. I think that's just come through now. Uh, yeah, so David Lindsay here um, with the local land services, and uh, I'm just going to do a bit of a presentation on uh, on feral pigs. Um, uh just bear with me as we get everything up and running um so yeah welcome everyone please uh if you have any questions today if you want to post them on there um i'll hopefully get to them as we go through the presentation um and if you've got a bit of time while we're waiting for a few people to come on um please jump over onto our events list on the facebook page um, have a look at our, our line up there and uh, right through right throughout winter and you can register your interest there and um, uh, yeah keep your skills updated um, and before I get started with the presentation uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today um, I pay my respects to the elders past present and emerging okay so We'll um, we'll jump into this now and um, uh, see that everything is um, is going all right. Um, okay, so feral pigs, uh, and we're we're probably going to um, uh, concentrate on crop stuff today, but um, you know pastures and and livestock are also affected by feral pigs, and and this can be uh used right across the whole area all the information we're talking about today is 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 uh is going to be relevant to to all um all livestock systems and, and cropping systems um so moving on that's that's the problem we've sort of faced with um you can see there the um the amount of pigs in in australia um the densities that we see uh obviously this is a pretty old map and, and uh, uh, it could be it could be a lot worse I think than this now the uh, pig numbers are def definitely increasing all the time um, but you can see our area is pretty much under that orange dot um, up near the Queensland border so that's most of our area there so you know it puts us into very common and widespread with feral pigs uh, some of the facts um, under favorable conditions uh, feral pigs can re produce all year uh, and so obviously winter uh, is not going to affect them if they've got plenty of feed uh, and shelter. Uh, a sow can breed uh, once she reaches 25 kilos in weight, uh, and that doesn't take long. That's only about six months, uh, again, with, with favourable con conditions. So um, it doesn't take long, and your young pigs are starting to produce pigs of their own, and the numbers can breed up really quickly. Uh, the litters can be anywhere from four to ten piglets a year, uh, and they can do that twice a year again with that with that favourable condition. So um, again, that that's pretty quick. Uh, large boars can disperse widely; they'll go up to 100, 150 kilometres, um, and it's estimated there's about 24 million feral pigs across 20, uh, 45 percent of Australia. The economic impacts. Um, and again, these figures are pretty are pretty um, old. So um, the cost of to agriculture has been estimated at well over a hundred million dollars each year. Uh, a lot of that will be in the cropping area, um, but again, there will be predation on lambs and things like that. So there's a lot of there's a lot of money to be lost through feral pigs. Uh, as I said, through predation, damage to the property and crops. Now. When we talk about crops, uh, we're not just talking about what they eat, uh, particularly in, in wheat crops and barley crops. 
it's the damage they do in the middle that they're rolling around building of nests that sort of stuff they tend to to um, uh, really make a mess of the crop and it they, they'll knock down far more than they'll ever eat so it's the it's the it's what's knocked down is is the big problem that uh, that we're faced with there's also competition um, and I'm talking more about uh, competition with with livestock for um, for grain and you know particularly if you're feeding stock and putting out grain or pellets or something to to your cattle um, pigs can can really eat quite a quite a bit of that they also host some serious diseases um, so it's estimated that a year-long outbreak of foot and mouth disease would uh, would cost us more than nine billion dollars um, that's a that's a lot of money I mean that that's going to really be a long way out of, of trying to to um, get ourselves out of that problem um, and of course we've also got um, African swine fever which is pretty much right on our doorstep at the moment uh, it's been spreading across the world and doing a lot of damage um, and brucellosis um, and and we've got quite a few people now who are being infected by brucellosis um, mainly people who are dealing with feral pigs um, and I'm talking about pig chasers that sort of thing um, anyone who, who even traps them and um, when they shoot them they get the blood on themselves um, they have been contracting brucellosis so um, we need to be very very careful with that one and of course uh, leptospirosis um, is spread it can be spread through our livestock and, and cause um, um, problems with fertility um, and calving lambing percentages so the environmental impacts obviously um, pigs are going to foul up water sources uh, trample and consume um, native vegetation um, they also facilitate the spread of weeds um, and we know that there's about 40 threatened species that are at risk from feral pigs also there's the the habitat uh, degradation um, and again we talked about the competition disease transmission so getting on to the control methods that we have as part of the local land services um, we can we can trap pigs and, and there's probably a lot of people out there listening who, who have used trapping um, as a method uh, shooting um, there's also dogging um, and that's chasing pigs with with dogs we're talking about uh, and poisoning with 1080 so if we go a little bit more into trapping um, it is a valuable tool and it will do a really good job for us um, in in that um, you can take a lot of pigs and you can see that trap there with a lot of pigs in it um, if it's done properly and, and you're prepared to work at it um, it's not too expensive um, you know to get a cage to to make up a trap uh, not not too dear and the grain that you put in it is um, um, yeah you, you don't use a whole lot of grain in there you don't need to remove stock from the area obviously if you if you do get sheep in a pig trap they're, they're easy to let out there's no problem there um, and cattle aren't going to be uh, a problem anyway they're not going to get through the doors um, but the problems we face with um, with trapping it is time consuming so you've got to be prepared to put enough time out there and be prepared to check your traps every day like any traps there is a, a legal responsibility to to check any trap that's set every single day rain hail or shine so it is important that once you set your trap you check it every day <clears throat> you will also have a certain amount of pigs that will be trap shy they just won't walk into the traps a lot of people will tell me that they have problems with pigs or feed on the grain that they put outside the trap right up to the door and they just won't walk inside the door so um, there is there is always that that element of trap shy pigs um, and it's only really going to remove a, a small percentage if you've got a large population so if there's a lot of pigs on your holding um, you're only going to get a few pigs at a time unless you can set up a pig trap like this one up the top there um, uh, and, and 
you know, you're going to get a lot of pigs into that one. But most people have smaller traps, get four or five pigs at a time. And unless you're taking out 70% uh, of your pig population, you're actually going backwards. So, um, yeah, so you just got to be aware that while you're trapping, uh, it may not be taking out enough of the population to, to be getting on top of them. It can also be hard to attract pigs when there's alternate uh, food sources about. Um, so, you know, obviously if, you're, if your crops have got grain in them, uh, the pigs are going to much prefer to be in a crop eating nice fresh grain um, than walking into a pig trap. So they're shooting, and there's obviously two types of shooting. They're shooting from a helicopter and they're shooting from a ground. Uh, helicopter shooting, it is very effective. It will do the job. It will do a great job for you. Um, you can use it in your crops. And, and really, once you get to a point where your crops have got starting to set grain, it's probably the only thing they're going to be able to use that will get those pigs in the crops or, or you know, get close enough to do something with them. So um, once you get to that stage, aerial shooting, is, is it may be the only thing that you can use. You can use it with stock. Obviously, the, the shooters are very well trained. Um, they can uh, differentiate between uh, pigs and, and livestock, and, and uh, there's a lot of effort goes into making sure that we don't disturb livestock whenever there's any aerial shooting going on. And you can actually get to where the pigs are. So obviously when they're in the crop, you can go in there, you can start to shoot them within the crop. Um, if they run out of there and into scrubland nearby, rough hills, you can actually follow them. Uh, and, and yeah, so you're, you're right where they are. You can cover large areas in a short time. Um, you know, not everyone knows exactly where the pigs are going to be on any one particular day. So it's uh, it's easy in a helicopter to fly around and actually find where those pigs are. And you can do that a lot quicker than you can any other way. But the problems that you have with that, it is expensive. So it does cost you a bit to um, to put a helicopter up. Anyone who's done that will, will know that. Um, but if you get the real, right results, um, it can work out um, work out pretty well. We're unable to take navigators. So obviously, um, you know, the landholders in a lot of cases can't actually get up there to see what's going on. Um, so that can be a little bit of a, of a problem. Obviously, if you're spending the money, you'd like to see what's actually happening from the air. Uh, the ground shooting, again, it's another important tool. Um, and it's good for mopping up. So if you've done an aerial shoot and it's not a bad idea to get around. After an aerial shoot, pigs tend to be disorientated outside their area. They don't really know where they are and they seem to pop up in different places. And if you're driving around with a rifle, you'll actually find some pigs will just be um, where you haven't seen them before and, and a little bit easier that you can clean up some of those pigs that have, have um, got away from you during the aerial shoot. Problems with ground shooting. Um, again, we're only going to get a small percentage. If you if you think you're going to shoot a lot of pigs um, when you've got a big population, you, you're not you're not really going to get anywhere out of that large population. Um, it has restrictions, obviously, um, distances in, and you know in built-up areas, firing firearms is not so good. There's noise and obviously licensing issues as, as well. Uh, then we have uh, dogging, um, and again, dogs can be very important at times to mop up some of those last pigs, again, after an aerial shoot, um, getting around, picking up some of those pigs that got away, um, dogs can be can be pretty handy. So they, and they can also remove an immediate problem. So if you've got um, pigs in your crop and you can't get your helicopter in for a while, um, you know they're doing a lot of damage in there. Um, by putting dogs in, they can actually get the pigs out of the crop. They'll, they'll get a few, but they'll move the problem away for a while, and it might just hold them off long enough for you to get your helicopter in and uh, and clean up the rest of the population later on. They also provide income and support. Um, so uh, it's so income and support, um, and there's a lot of people out there that just go pig chasing for the fun of it um, but while the pig boxes are open they are worth money and that can actually create some of the problems 
Um, and those problems sort of revolve around promoting uh, of farming of the pigs. So if pigs are worth money, um, pe people, <coughs> pardon me, <laughs> well, pigs are worth money. If they can, if they can draw some income out of it, they don't particularly want to take out pigs that aren't going to um, uh, be worth any money. Leave them till later on when they're a bit bigger, and and then you can put them in the pig box. So that's that's one of the things we need to try and ensure that doesn't occur. We don't need to be um, to be farming pigs in any way. Again, they'll only take out those big ones as I talked to before. Um, and it can agitate the pigs if you um, make other programs less effective. So uh, if you are going to do a helicopter shoot, you don't particularly want to have your dogs in there prior chasing the, the pigs around and scattering them all around the place where it then takes a lot longer to find where those mobs of pigs are. Same with your 1080 programs. If you're doing a 1080 program, you don't need to hunt, hunt the pigs away. You need them to be reasonably calm and settled and eating the grain, the free feeds uh, appropriately. Uh, and obviously dogging, it will only remove that small percentage as we talked about of a large population. They're only going to get a few um, and they'll breed quicker than the, when then the dogs can take them out. Can also give you a false perception. Um, a lot of people think, seem to think that they've got their pig numbers under control because they've got pig chasers coming in every weekend chasing their pigs. Uh, if pig chasers are coming in and getting pigs every weekend, your problem's a lot bigger than you think. Uh, and just and just uh, having pig chasers is not going to to get on top of the problem. And of course, uh, lost dogs have the potential to add to our wild dog population, which is is always an issue. Um, so 1080 poisoning, in my opinion, by far the most effective and efficient way of controlling feral pigs. Um, it doesn't discriminate between sizes. So any pigs that are eating on the free feeds, eating grain, uh, will die if they once they've eaten 1080. So it doesn't matter if they're five kilos or 55 kilos. Um, they they will all die once the 1080 grain goes out, provided they are eating the grain um, prior to the free feeds. It is very cheap to the landholder. So at the moment we supply all our 1080 um, free of charge, so there's no cost on the on the 1080. Um, there is a little bit of wheat left over. We had a, a program where we were supplying some wheat through the drought. There's a little bit of that left. So if anyone is wanting some some grain, we are actually supplying a bit of free grain as well. Um, it is very easy to use. Um, it's if, if it's done properly, it can be very effective. And, you know, just by putting out a few piles of grain, monitoring those when the pigs start to eat it, do your three free feeds and and put your 1080 bait out and you'll. Um, um, yeah. You'll, you'll get all the pigs that have been there feeding. There are a few problems again. Um, it can't be used with stock. So a stock will die if they eat the 1080 grain as well. So you need to make sure that you are putting your 1080 out in an area where there are no stock uh, or, or any non-target species. So you need to make sure that you're avoiding um, maybe feral goats or, or kangaroos or anything like that as well. Um, pig carcasses can cause a secondary poisoning um, of domestic dogs. Um, that's always a bit of an issue. Um, dogs are very susceptible to 1080, so we need to make sure that none of our domestic dogs can get access uh, to the carcasses after a, a, um, a poisoning program. You also have to have a chemical user card um, to be able to obtain 1080. Um, we do um, chemical courses just just to cover 1080. It doesn't cover anything else. Um, or it covers Pindone um, and PAP and Khaleesi virus. Um, they're the only the only things that covered under the our, the training courses we do. They are free um, and we run those about once a month around the area. But if there's enough people in any particular area, we can always organize another uh, another training course. So um, 
if you're interested in doing one of these courses just contact your local office and hopefully they can um, we'll get you onto a list or, or find one that's close to you and um, we can get you through that training course group control um, because those pigs and the, the populations have that reproductive ability they can at least double annually and, and that's at least um, so as I said before um, if you're not taking out 70% of your population you're you're actually going backwards so you need to be taking out 70% of any pigs on your holding just to stay at the same number of pigs year on year in year out so just be aware of that it's got to be you've got to be doing a pretty good job so um, the, the campaigns need to be highly effective to have uh, an impact so it needs to be coordinated um, if everyone in a group can decide to bait at the same time so it doesn't matter where the pigs are on whether they're on your holding or the next door neighbor's place if you're both baiting at the same time you're going to be able to to control those pigs uh, a lot easier and as I said coordinated within those groups is um, is the way to um, to go it's going to save you a lot of money in the long run um, obviously one person baiting their own property can bait five or six times a year to try and to try and keep um, to keep those pig numbers under control and when I'm talking about you know coordinated I, I'm not just talking about baiting programs I'm talking about helicopter programs or, or any anything that's doing if, if it can work as a group it'll definitely work out cheaper in the long run um, to um, to work together it needs to be timely so we're we're looking at uh, you know before grain sets um, if you're doing a poisoning program obviously before the the, the grain starts to set in the in the heads of your crops uh, it's a lot easier to get your pigs to eat the grain then once the crops start to set ahead um, even if it's that soft milky grain they, they probably even prefer that um, once they get in there and they start eating that it's really hard to get them back out to, to take grain so uh, you need to sort of work on on thinking about it and planning to do these jobs before the, the, the crops get too far uh, advanced and it's good to be to, to be putting out grain when pigs are looking for food and we're talking mainly in winter so in the middle of winter when you know a lot of the grasses have, have sort of dried off a bit um, there's no crops with heads on at that point uh, and pigs are really looking for protein it's a lot easier to get them onto the grain at about that point so it's um it's good to be you know looking at the best time and, and and making making plans and having yourself ready to go when it's the optimum time to to get the pigs it also needs to be integrated so we need to be able to use all of the uh, options that we have available so you know if you're bringing a helicopter in and you've got your group set up and five or six people all get together the helicopter goes around and shoots you know maybe you could you could follow up with um, with some ground shooting or, or bring some dogs in and, and, and see if you can get a few more pigs or or give them a few weeks to settle down and then try and, and try and get um, um, some grain and see if you can get them to take some grain then you might be able to get a poisoning program going so yeah use all those options available they're all there so um, yeah try them all out and of course broad scale so we're looking at covering as big an area as we possibly can um, so the more people that got involved in the group obviously the better the results are going to be um, the next slide I have actually shows a little bit about what happens with uh, pigs this is actually a collaring program that Darren Marshall did up around St George um, and it does actually give you a bit of an insight into some of the pigs um, and how they um, how they they move around a lot of the landholders here believe that the pigs were moving to the national park and you can see right at the top of the the picture there there's a quite a large dark area which is the national park and most of the landholders believe that their pigs were moving backwards and forwards between the national parks and their holdings all the time um, and this actually showed in the three months period that not one of the pigs that had collared went to the national parks 
So that was uh, that was quite interesting. Um, it also shows that the pigs remained pretty much in the area where they were. There's only just the odd ones that that moved from the area. Um, and a lot of that was to do with actually when they were trying to get the pig, the collars off the pigs and they were trying to catch the pigs to do that. Um, once they started to hunt them, they, they moved over, over a distance. So, um, yeah, so that just shows, you know, even if you don't get into a group and you do the stuff on your own holding, you know, the, in some cases the pigs are there and they're not going to move in. This shows in three months with plenty of feed and plenty of water, plenty of cover, they don't really want to move very far. So, you know, if you can't get a group going, you will still get really good results by by just doing your own stuff. Um, one of the important things is just to just to do the sums, you know, understand what the pigs are actually costing you. A lot of people can tell me, particularly croppers can tell me, you know, how much if they don't spray their weeds, how much that costs them. If they don't put enough fertilizer on that, they can pretty much come up with a figure, but they generally can't tell me how much the pigs are costing them. So it's not a bad idea if you can put a dollar figure on it. So if you can actually sit down, um, just a bit of a guesstimate on, on how much the loss of income from crop destruction. Um, so if you know that, you know, there was 5% of a particular paddock that was knocked down and the rest of the crop, uh, you know what it yielded, you know what it, what it, um, um, what you sold the grain for, you can soon work out if you take out 5% of that in one corner or one area, uh, how much those pigs have, have cost you. So you can get a dollar figure through that way. You can also add to that any um, any costs that you've spent on your helicopters so it, or, or even your bait, ground baiting, what grain costs, that sort of stuff. Um, add all that stuff into it. Don't forget wages. So if you're running traps or doing that sort of stuff, put in a, in a time of, of um, you know, how much it's actually spend, how much it's costing you in time. Because while you're doing this, you're, you're not doing something else that's so probably just as important. Um, if you can itemise it to identify those uh, those cost effects on the cost centres, um, that'll that'll sort of work it all out for you. Then you can actually create a percentage of loss to cost. So then you've got an idea of you know, all right, this is how much it's spending. This is how much I'm spending on it. But this is how much they're costing me, um, and and it makes it a lot easier then to work out what's happening from year to year, whether you're getting in front or whether you're going behind. And if you if it's getting worse each year, then you know you've got to pick up your, your game and go a little bit further. So um, it's probably the only way you're going to know whether your pig numbers are really getting worse or, or the damage that it's causing is, is getting worse. And, and from a local land services point of view, we would like to know if there's any... Um, um, Non-sensitive figures. We don't. We don't need to know. Um, you know your the intimate details of your uh, finances and, and how your business is running. But we would like to know roughly what the damages are costing you. It just helps us to get a bit of an idea of what's happening out in the in the um, um, out in the field. What people are actually faced with, and yeah, you know, sometimes it can help us to um, you know when we start looking to apply for some funding to to do to do works in different areas. If we've got some figures and we can actually show that um, um, that um, uh, we can, you know, what's happening out there, it can help us with those applications. So how can we help? Uh, as I said before, we supply 1080, uh, it's free of charge. As I said, there was a little bit of grain left. Um, once that's gone, um, I'm not sure that we'll be re redoing that at this stage, but at the moment, 1080 is free, looks to remain free into the future. Um, we can offer those specific um, chemical user training. Uh, at a, I've got a minimal cost. At the moment, they're free, um, and hopefully into the future that will remain. So, um, yeah, if you if you want to, if 1080 is your biggest concern, we can do those courses for you. Uh, we also have traps that we can use for short-term loans. So if you want to come and borrow those off us, um, there's no problems there. Um, we do have fast accredited shooters and we can actually coordinate, coordinate programs uh, on the ground. 
Um, we don't do a lot of that. Um, there is a, there's quite a few uh, helicopter companies out there that can actually do that. Um, and they um, they can do that probably at a, at a bit cheaper price than what we can actually offer that through. So um, a lot of landholders that I know go through their own um, go through their own uh, companies and, and shoot when they they need to. Uh, we can also provide uh, technical advice. So anytime anyone's um, got any questions at all, uh, feel free to give us a call. Um, we've got a lot of people who have uh, been around for a while and and um, and know quite a few ticks and tips and tricks and things to to help with uh, any programs that you're doing. So by all means, give us a call uh, at at our local at your local uh, land services office, and uh, you'll be able to be able to talk to someone and, and get some advice. <clears throat> How do you get involved in groups? Uh, talk to your local land service. Like I said, land care groups also, they like to um, uh, get involved in some of these programs. Um, they don't have to be large. You know, you really don't have to have a lot of people together to to be, to, to, to see the benefits. Um, so even if you just work with your neighbour, um, that's a big start. And those groups can then just build basically around, uh, around that. Um, so we're basically on to any questions. Um, I haven't actually seen any questions come through. Um, so I'm not certain that um, that there is anything out there. Um, so I would say that if there's nothing there, if anyone does have a question, by all means post it um, and we can we can send something back to you later on. That's not a problem. Uh, again, just uh, if you if you want to jump over onto that uh, event that we have on our Facebook, have a look what's there. There's a lot of stuff there that that could be a lot of interest to, to everyone. Um, they go throughout winter, uh, and just remember to register your interest. Um, and uh, obviously, they'll um, you'll be able to hop on and, and get some information. Again, if um, if uh, you have anything that you would like to hear about, uh, if you think there's a topic that you'd like to um, like us to cover, by all means get in touch with us through back through Facebook, um, or um, um, even if you talk to us through the local land service office, uh, we can set about trying to to get something out there for you to um, to um, to cover your needs. So um, that's pretty much it. Um, thank you again for for listening um, and connecting in, and um, hopefully um, yeah, into the the future we can get pig numbers under control. Thanks very much.